Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, emperors and elephants, welcome to another episode of Clarifying Catholicism. You're watching part eight of a series on the history of the ecumenical councils according to the Catholic Church. Today we are covering Constantinople III. Much of this information was gathered from Joseph Kelly's The Ecumenical Councils of the Catholic Church, A History. So if you want an in-depth dive into these topics, make sure to pick up a copy of his book. To see the rest of our episodes, check out our playlist in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. In the last episode, we explored the mighty Byzantine Emperor Justinian's attempts to reunite the Roman Empire, both politically and religiously. We concluded with his failure to bring about peace between the pro-Monophysite Christians, Christians who believed that Jesus was only divine and not human, and pro-Chalcedonian Christians, those who believed that Jesus was both human and divine. The centuries after Justinian's death would show the failure of his political vision as well. As the East was plagued by constant invasions, particularly by the Persians, and the West found a better way to deal with hostile powers. Conversion. I suppose the old saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them. But in this case, it appears that the remnants of the Western Roman Empire found a way to make their aggressors join them instead. Once again, the Eastern Empire needed all hands on deck to defend their homeland against enemy forces. So once again, the Eastern emperors set out to devise some doctrinal formula that would pacify both Monophysites and Chalcedonians. This time, rather than claim that Christ was not human, perhaps a better tactic would be to accept Christ's humanity with the caveat that his human body was directed by one divine source, or one divine will. Basically, Jesus Christ was fully human and fully divine, but it just so happened that every single decision he made in his life came from his divine side. This was called monothelitism. The West immediately smelled something fishy, but conveniently, the current Pope, Honorius I, was not exactly very theologically bright. Around 638, the Patriarch of Constantinople got Honorius to formally agree with this idea. That same year, both of them died. Also in 638, a new religion slash empire was knocking on Christian Europe's door. The founder of Islam, Muhammad, managed to unite scattered Arab tribes into an empire of his own. By the mid-600s, Islam had conquered Syria, Jerusalem, and Alexandria, three of the former powerhouse Christian societies. Antioch also found itself on the defensive. Interestingly enough, the Islamic conquests actually helped the Monophysites, since the Islamic Empire didn't really care about internal divisions within Christianity. While the Romans still cared about quelling Monophysitism and Monothelitism, the Byzantines were not. They wanted to take land back from the Muslims and saw the West's obsession with doctrinal orthodoxy as a hindrance towards the reunification of the Roman Empire. So, fed up with Rome, they kidnapped the sickly Pope Martin I, forced him to Constantinople, and charged him with disloyalty. He died in exile soon after. Emperor Constans II had Maximus the Confessor, perhaps one of the most brilliant Eastern theologians who had ever lived, tortured so that he would accept monothelitism. When he refused, his captors cut off his hand and tongue so that he could never preach or write against monothelitism again. He died later the next year, joining the ongoing list of Eastern theologians such as Athanasius of Alexandria and John Chrysostom, who were ironically persecuted by their own emperors. Emperor Constance was assassinated in 668. His successor was far friendlier to Rome, but could not orchestrate a formal council to iron out these matters until the Muslims had been dealt with. Finally, in 680, the Third Council of Constantinople was called. Constantinople III formally condemned monothelitism. They also condemned several deceased bishops of Constantinople, as well as Pope Honorius, the guy who earlier in this video had unwittingly committed heresy. In one last ditch effort to save the cause, one monothelite priest claimed he could prove his theological ideas by raising someone from the dead. The council entertained his claim, brought a corpse into the chamber, and surprise, surprise, the resurrection attempt failed. Finally, after centuries of quibbling about the natures of Christ and his relationship with God the Father, the Christological councils had come to an end. 
I'd like to draw attention to the fact that it took over 600 years to definitively answer what are now considered to be rudimentary questions about who Jesus Christ is. As a Catholic growing up in the 21st century, it bothers me to no end how some traditionalist Catholics will accuse the Second Vatican Council of being too vague in certain theological areas, such as ecumenicism and other religions. I would like to propose that just as it took over half a millennium to build the foundations of our faith's Christology, it could also take more than a couple of generations to better develop the theology that Vatican II introduced. Furthermore, I am more than tired of hearing Catholics claim that our church is more divided than ever, or that Vatican II's implementation was unprecedentedly messy. So far, I've not seen any bishops executed or torn limb from limb by angry mobs on the streets on account of Vatican II. If there's one thing we can learn from the Christological councils, it is that doctrinal development is slow and even painful. Though an overarching theme that will become evident in the next set of videos is that politics corrupts religion, and that the separation of church and state accelerated by the First Vatican Council and articulated in the Second is perhaps the wisest way to prevent greedy bishops from botching theology for the sake of their political interests. See you next time.